As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I ask that every head be bowed, every eye be closed. Our Father and our God in heaven, we come before you thanking you for this great privilege and opportunity to not only be reminded of, but to also remember the life that was given, the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary for our sins. We pray, O God, that on this afternoon, as we take a moment to pause in our regular service to take part in a sacrament or an ordinance, which we have been commanded and instructed to keep. We pray, Lord, that you would put our hearts in the right space, our minds be in the right place. As we not only seek to honor you, O God, in heaven, but also remember the work of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you again for this time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated at this time. The Bible is very, very clear on the night in which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was sitting at that table with his disciples participating in what would be their last supper together prior to his death on the cross. And as he sat there with his disciples after dinner was completed, he took this piece of bread that was there and he told his disciples, he said, this This is my body, which is being broken and bruised for you. He says, when you eat of this bread, you do some remembrance of me. In a similar manner, he took the cup and he said to his disciples that when you drink of this cup, you are drinking of my blood and remembering forgiveness of your sins. And so it is throughout Christianity, throughout our history, we have often participated in what we call the Lord's Supper or communion where we would gather together on a pretty consistent basis and take part in these elements as we remember the life and the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of instructions as you prepare to take communion on today. We want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that many people who partake in communion do so to their own detriment because they have not check their hearts. They have not repented of their sins. They do not take seriously the sacrament or the ordinance in which we are about to participate in. And so we want to challenge and encourage you and also remind you to make sure that you are checking your heart, your motives behind taking communion. Secondly, in our tradition as Baptists, we believe communion is for baptized believers, not just those who have professed their faith internally, but those who have professed their faith faith publicly through baptism. Uh So for those of you who are in the house today who may be visiting, you are a baptized believer, then we encourage you to partake. We also encourage parents of those children who you know your kids may be at a certain place with their faith to conduct yourself accordingly as you are here on today. Finally, as a words to a familiar song that we sing each time that we take communion is about to be heard. We ask that you will pause for a moment in silence and reflect not only on your own life, your own sin, but the fact that Jesus Christ has come to cover that sin, that he took on that sin, so that that way you and I would not have to experience the full punishment and penalty of our sin. He who is blameless takes on the sin of those who ought to be in blame, so that that way those who are guilty and should experience the punishment and penalty. That punishment and penalty has been laid on him as opposed to being laid on you and I. So if you listen to the words of the blood, we ask, or I ask, that you will, in a moment of silence and reflection, not only confess any uh, unconfessed sin and repent for it, but that you'd also reflect on the fact that you and I serve a good God who is not only faithful, but is worthy of all of our praises. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It's will never lose its power, 
it soon I doubt and calm my fears and it dries all my tears the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose it will never lose it will never lose its power and so our great god in heaven as we come before you as commanded by you to do this in remembrance of christ our savior we pray and ask that even in the challenges and difficulties of this life and the realities of our sin, we thank you that we can not only come to you with the understanding that you will forgive us, but we have the assurance, the confidence that we will be forgiven. In spite of how many times we fall down, your grace it continues to cover us. So I pray, Lord, on today that we will be reminded of not the falling down, but the importance of getting back up. Thank you for this time. Forgive us for our unconfessed sins. Thank you for your faithfulness, even at times with our faithlessness. Thank you that your love is still all-encompassing, all-consuming, and at times even overwhelming. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So it was on that faithful night that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he took that bread, he broke it, and told his disciples that this was his body being broken to them. He then gave them some of that bread, and he told them to each eat. Shall we eat together? Can we say thank you, Jesus? In a similar manner, he took that cup and he said to his disciples, this is my blood that is being poured out for the remission of the forgiveness of your sins. And he gave to them that they may drink. Shall we drink together? Can we say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Our Father and our God in heaven, we again thank you for this opportunity to not only remember about the life 
the blood that was shed on the cross that was also given for us. We also remember the resurrection that too is reminiscent and reminding of not only what happened 2,000 years ago, but what happens to all of us who believe that Jesus Christ is not only Lord, but have made him our Lord, personal Lord and Savior. We pray that in our time on this afternoon, you have been honored in remembering Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also pray that we not only remember, reflect of the repentance in which we've had to do, but we also rejoice in the salvation that has been given to us. For just as Christ got up from the grave, we too will get up from our graves, death no longer having, having its sting or its power over us, because we have been given life and life brand new. We thank you, O oh God in heaven, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, amen. All righty, everyone. You stand to your feet, hold your Bibles high in the air. If you have a cell phone which you use as your written text, you may hold that in there at this time also. Uh, we want to take a moment to dismiss any of our kids, I believe, that are going next door. This time they can make their way next door. As they're making their way next door, some of you are standing up. You are, or I should say Bibles, some of your cell phones in hand. Let us go ahead and make this declaration that we make each week here at Kingdom Life Church that you will see on the screen here momentarily. And so let us say it together, the declaration we make about this book each week. All ready to go, one, two, three. This is my Bible. I believe it is infallible, incorruptible, and uncompromising word of God. I believe I can do what it tells me I can do. I believe that when I do what it tells me to do, then I will have what it says I will have. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, this morning you may be seated at this time. Very excited to have all of you here in the house on today. A couple of announcements, just so that way you are aware of them. No youth group this week or tonight, and so if you were expecting to send your kids here this evening to have more time away from them, well, joke's on you because you get to keep your young people with you at home on today. Secondly, tomorrow's night is Men's Monday Night Bible, Bible Study Discipleship, finds in the 40. We will be meeting tomorrow, even though we did not meet last week. So thank you for the men who continue to come. We only have a couple of weeks left before we will pause for the summer. So if you have not come and you want to check us out, please do so this week or next week. Bible study, Wednesday night. Now, we'll be back here live on Wednesday night. It will not be just a recorded version only. It will be recorded as well as live and in person. So you are free to come to be a part of the audience on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Thursday, Women's Discipleship is at 6.30. That says until 7.30, but they never get out at 7.30, and so we just need to put 6.30 until moving forward. Um, now, we're so glad that the women are getting worked on so well, because uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we, are, we are thankful that, that, that our women love not only the community of one another, but more importantly, love to learn God's word as they spend time in fellowship and in reading and studying his word. And then we'll be back here next week, Sunday, um, for our graduation Sunday. Don't forget all of those who are graduating, especially those who are graduating from high school into college or college and upper level education degrees, please let us know. Now, if you have a young person who is, you know, graduating from what is it, kindergarten to first grade, fifth grade to sixth grade, eighth grade to ninth grade, you can share that with us. Also, as we want to acknowledge and to celebrate them, too, on next Sunday. For those of you who are high school or college graduate, if you have your cap and gown, please wear them. We would love you for you to have, we would love for you to be able to represent your school up here. Now, if you wear your cap and gown, you don't have to wear it the whole service. We just want you to wear it for a small piece of the service as we acknowledge and honor those who are graduating. To those who have contributed to the academic recognition financially in order to be a blessing to those students who have received those gifts, thank you for your generous contributions. Thank you for not only being part of the sharing of the good that God has given you, but being willing to share, especially with those of the household of faith. And so next week is academic recognition, and then the week after that is Father's Day, but I won't go into all of that. We will wait until next week to talk more about Father's Day. 
That being said, I want to take a look at a text for today. We are now in our summer series dealing with the book of Proverbs. For those of you who are new to Kingdom Life, this is something that we have done the last, man, 12 or 13 years where every summer we spend time going through different proverbial pieces of nuggets of wisdom in which we just highlight either a section or a verse and we kind of dive into what Solomon is trying to say to us based upon the proverb in which he is communicating to you and I. Last week we talked about the purpose of Proverbs, and so if you missed last week, you can always look online, you can do it through our app or even through our YouTube channel, you can see last week's sermon, as it will give you more insight into this week's sermon. Now, if you missed last week's sermon and you're here today, don't worry, the sermons are totally unconnected, unrelated, other than the fact that they both come from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a book of wisdom in which is written by Solomon, king of Israel, the last king of Israel to actually govern both the southern and the northern kingdom, all of Israel, because after him the kingdom will be divided. At 18 or so years old, when he takes on the kingdom, God comes to him and asks him what he would like. Anything he wants, God will give to him. Solomon does not ask for land, does not ask for power, does not ask for money, does not even ask for more of the, the, the desires of this life. He simply asks for the necessary wisdom to govern God's people in a respectable and honorable way. God not only grants him wisdom, but in granting him wisdom, he gives him all the other things that come along with wisdom, as well as making him the wisest man slash king of his time, before his time, and even beyond. And so these short, pithy statements, these nuggets of wisdom that communicate not always absolute truths, but truths that are timely if applied appropriately to the specific moment in your life are particular epigrams or nuggets of wisdom that will help you and I navigate this life more accurately. I'm just seeing how long it's going to take for anybody to say something. Yeah. I just said a lot. I didn't get not one amen. That's all right. Thank you, baby. Good. All righty. Today I want to talk about, from Proverbs 10, 29, the concept of a life of liberty. Many of us, if we are going to be honest with ourselves, would like to live a life of total freedom. In fact, if you are a citizen of this great country, then part of what our Constitution, part of what our foundational values and principles are built on is the concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The concept of living a life where no one can really dictate how that's going to be lived as long as you obey certain laws that have been given to govern us as a society as a whole, meaning you do not have the right to infringe upon someone else's pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And so as long as you and I live according to certain laws, then we have the freedom to live our lives free from bondage or some type of confinement, i.e. prison. But we also talk about the life of liberty, the sense of freedom in which you and I move freely about our country and our society in a way in which we can not only pretty much govern ourselves if we govern ourselves accordingly, but have the freedom to kind of choose the different types of uh, preferences or professions or lifestyles in which we like to live. And ultimately, everybody wants to be happy. I mean, there's not a person in here who does not want to be happy. In fact, some of us would rather be happy as opposed to holy is often why you and I are living and wandering around in sin. And so our country has these foundational principles in which we try to live on, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but even in the Bible, Solomon will describe for us how you and I can live a life of liberty, freedom, and not so much the pursuit of happiness, but still experiencing happiness in the life in which we are pursuing. But in order for us to understand that, or understand one aspect of a life of liberty, we must understand some key concepts to this proverb. So today, living a life of liberty. Would you bow your heads and forward forward to pray with me? Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are, how you continue to work in all of our lives to bring about your truth, your wisdom, and your insight. I ask that you will not remove me, allow your Holy Spirit to take over, so that it's not my words nor my truth, but your words and your truth. That your people will hear your word. And all of us today will be edified. 
For you are great God, you alone are glorified. Thank you for those who are in attendance, either in present today in the sanctuary or online. Thank you for those who will even hear or see this later. I pray and ask that in all of this, that you, you are glorified. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. All God's people said. Here, Solomon makes a statement in Proverbs 10, 9. It goes like this. He who walks in integrity walks securely. But he who perverts his ways will be found out. He who walks in integrity walks securely. But he who perverts his ways will be found out. Now, I want to be clear this morning at the outset, my wife doesn't like me to give disclaimers, but I am tired. Why am I tired? Because we just experienced a state track meet for Lansing Sexton High School, and yesterday, unlike most of the meets in which I schedule, which are on Fridays, we had a meet yesterday. And it was 88 to 92 degrees the entire time we were out there, from about 9 o'clock in the morning till about 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon. I am not only, what, I was not only hot and tired, but I got home from Grand Rapids pretty late, and then I laid down to get up early this morning to finish, okay, to finish completely. I started the sermon. I don't think I didn't start it. To complete the sermon which God had laid on my heart. That all being said, normally I schedule meets on Fridays, so Saturday I recover. So Sunday I'm strong to preach. The meat was yesterday. I'm recovering. All right. He who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found out. If we were to break this proverb down clause by clause, we would see in the very first clause, he who walks. We're talking about one's lifestyle. The Hebrew word for walk here, halak, means to go or to walk. To not only go or to walk, but to go or to walk around or about. It's the concept of one who is either walking around or walking about their way. It also can mean this, to go up or down, but specifically highlighting one's behavior, how one behaves oneself. So the individual who is living a lifestyle, one who is got certain type of behavior. This particular word is used over 1,500 times in the New Old Testament. 1,500 times in the Old Testament, and it is usually associated with one's decision to walk in either covenantal disobedience or obedience. Okay? Do not miss that because, again, while this word in its generic use is the concept of what? One walking around or about, it is also used figuratively throughout the Old Testament as an expression of one's not only pursuit in life, but whether or not one will walk in obedience or disobedience to the Lord's law, covenantal commandments. What am I saying when I say that? I'm saying that when you see this word, it is often associated with whomever it's talking about, whether or not the individual or individuals, meaning the individual or the group of individuals or people, are choosing to walk according to God's law. And this is important because you and I need to understand that when you and I get up in the morning, you have decisions to make throughout the course of the day. Just like you would decide what you eat for breakfast, what you will wear that day to work or to school, you have a decision to make in whether or not you will wake up that morning and choose to walk according to God's laws and principles or according to your own way of living and thinking. And so the, 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 the command here, the instruction here, is trying to describe the individual who is walking, although it is often associated with whether or not they will obey or disobey God's covenantal laws. It goes on to say this, he who walks in what? In integrity. In integrity here, the Greek word, Hebrew word, excuse me, that is used here is used approximately 200 times, but it has, it, it has different forms and nuances. And so depending on the context, depending on what word is connected to, will determine what it means in a particular context. In its general use, it can mean blameless, innocent, sincere, quiet, peaceful, pious, pure. And this is important because it gives us just the general use or meaning of this particular word in the Hebrew when it is used. That which is complete, that which is blameless. I like the words just and honest. And so a lifestyle here of honesty, when one chooses to walk honestly, or when one has a habit of living in honesty, 
Solomon is saying here. More specifically here in this particular use with regards of integrity, we see that it, while it is often used in reference to one's attitude, it often also reflects one's genuineness or reliability. And I don't miss this, because when we talk about one being genuine, you've all talked to or experienced disingenuine people. That's the person that says it's good to see you or happy to see you, and they're lying. They really don't want to see you. They are just simply trying to be professional, or they're trying to be courteous due to the context or the people around them, but they really don't like you, and you don't like them either, all right? Anybody got individuals in your lives in which you come in contact with where they are phony and you are just as phony? Why? Because you are very disingenuine in that moment. The concept here of one who's walking in integrity is the concept of one who is not only genuine, but also very reliable. Reliable means that you and I can rely on the individual or are reliable in and of ourselves. If someone asks you to do something, you will do it. See, part of integrity here is not only the concept of honesty, but it's also this concept of one who is genuine, but also reliable. Now, all this is important because, again, context will determine what word will be used, but it is important for us to understand that in the Hebrew, words may, that, may that have a general meaning but may be nuanced in other ways in their meaning in order for you and I to make sense out of what uh, 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 Solomon is saying. So when he makes this statement, he who walks in integrity, it is often used in reference to one's attitude reflecting genuineness and reliability. Integrity in the English means this, adherence to moral and ethical principles. It's a soundness in moral character, i.e., honesty. Now, for those of you who are wondering, just dictionary.com, you'll get the same definition that I got. What I want you to see here is that when we look at the English use of the word integrity combined with the Hebrew ancient use of the word integrity, there are some similarities in the description or explanation or understanding of the word integrity. Honesty is one of them. And so when a person is walking in honesty, when they are sound or oftentimes unimpaired, meaning in some cases a perfect condition, and when I looked at this word, or the idea of perfect condition, there was a sentence that went along with it on dictionary.com that said a ship is unimpaired. It is in perfect condition, meaning it's ready to sail. So this is not the concept of you are perfect, meaning that you will never make a mistake, but it just simply means that in this presentation, there are no blemishes in which we can see. All right? Solomon is saying here, he who walks in integrity. The individual who makes a habit of their lifestyle in living a life that is full of honesty, but not just honesty, it is this adherence to moral and ethical principles. Now, what we also need to understand about this word integrity is, and of course combined, or I should say, and combined with the word walks, it is also this understanding that you and I are being characterized by a manner of one who is performing the action. In essence, he who walks in care and integrity this word integrity, the person who is doing the walking is being characterized by the actions in which they are performing. Right. You see, people can say anything that they want to you, but actions speak louder than words. Yeah. See, if you say you love me, then that guarantees that you will conduct yourself a certain way when you come in contact with me. Right. Recently talked to an individual, a young man, who told me that they were not a quitter, yet they had just quit. What's interesting is when you try to tell people what you are not, even though we just saw you do the opposite, you've already told us who you were by what you did, not by just what you said. You see, it is easier to say one thing than it is to live that same thing out. In essence, you can say just about anything, but how you live will determine for you and I and everyone else how you really feel and what you really think on the inside. And so... A person of honesty, an individual who is walking in integrity, an individual who is living a life, not only describes an individual whose characteristics are performed by their actions, but furthermore, it describes a distinguished person who desires to adhere to the values distinguished as God-fearing. Now, this is important, and we recognize this because it's in the Bible. 
Whenever the Bible talks about integrity, it's not just talking about integrity from a worldly standpoint. Because people will assume that you and I have integrity, even though it's not godly behavior, which we are demonstrating. And I'm here to tell you that when the Bible talks about integrity, while it is true that it will reflect or show up in the worldly world, it must still be defined by that which the Bible says is godly character or Christ-centered attitudes and actions. And so when Solomon uses this word honesty, he is not only attaching it to the concept of performing certain actions or living a certain way based upon how you feel on the inside, but also based upon your ability to walk in God-fearing principles, laws, and statutes. Okay. All right. I get it. It's warm in here. But some of y'all is getting a little bit warmer. Because you got very little integrity. Okay? All right? Okay? And when we say integrity, I'm not just talking about your ability to say who you are and to live according to what you have said. There's a level of honesty in you saying who you are and then living that way. But if what you are saying is wrong and how you are living is wrong, that's not biblical integrity. That's not the type of Christ-centered character in which we're looking at or that Solomon is trying to highlight. The point being here is this individual is not only looking to be well-received by the world because they do what they say they're going to do and they live by the, the, the words that come out of their mouths through their actions with their hands, but more importantly, this individual or individuals are living according to God's laws as well as his statutes, his principles, his commandments, even when they do not line up with the world's commandments. Let me tell you something. This is not really in this text, but this is a nugget for you to take out of here with you. When you live according to the laws of the Lord, whether or not it lines up with the laws of men is really irrelevant because it will still give you the favor of God in the midst and the presence of men. All right? Proverbs 10, 9 goes on to say, he who walks in integrity walks securely. When it describes this concept of walking securely, it is describing this particular individual who is not only walking in Christ-centered character or living a lifestyle with a habit of honesty, but it also is communicating the way in which they now, or I should say the results in which they now experience as a result of how they are living. Hebrew word for security here means to trust. Okay? Means to trust. Next slide. Keep going. Means to trust or to put one's trust in. All right. It can also be to be confident or full of confidence. Now, the way it is used here because of the words in which it's connected with the word integrity and securely, securely or security being joined together, or I should say the, the Hebrew word for, for, for trust here. It communicates the concept of security, meaning to feel safe or to feel secure. All right? Now, he who walks in integrity, he who walks in honesty, the individual who makes a habit in their lifestyle of being honest, the individual who lives a life according to the Lord's law, this individual walks in complete confidence. They walk in security. Okay? Now, this can mean one of several things when we make this statement that the individual who is living this way is experiencing a certain level of security. What is Solomon saying? Solomon is saying this, before I break it down. Correct conduct creates complete confidence. Okay? Correct conduct creates complete confidence. Now, this statement all by itself does not really clarify totally the type of conduct nor the confidence that has been created because of one's lifestyle. So let me explain it to you in more simplified ways. Instead of just saying that correct conduct creates complete confidence, we could say it this way. Blameless behavior bails one out of bondage. OK? Blameless behavior bails one out of bondage. Now, when I make this statement or when this statement is made, the question then becomes, what do you mean by this? It is when you and I are walking in behavior or living out a lifestyle that submits itself to the laws that have been put around us. When you and I submit to the laws that man has given or the laws that God has given, all of a sudden our behavior, our lifestyle is blameless. It does not mean that it's perfect. 
It does not mean that it's without sin. It just means, for the most part, you do what you say you're going to do because what you say you're going to do is based upon biblical principles. Biblical teaching affects your lifestyle, and therefore you want to live or walk with behavior that is blameless. When you live this way, it bails you out of bondage. What is bondage? Being confined, being restricted, or better yet, just the sense of bondage. Let me give you an example. When you are driving down the street and you are not paying attention to the speed limit but enjoying your drive and you see that officer a few yards up, the first thing you do is check your speed. Cover your brake and you tap it just to be on the safe side. In fact, if you're going fast enough, when you pass by, you do what? Check your rear view mirror, your side view mirror, you start to sweat and wonder whether or not they're going to follow you. Why? Because in that moment, you recognize that your driving was not in obedience to the law that was set, that was set by a, 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 a post or a sign that says so and so miles per hour. But then the individual who is to enforce the law that has been set by the sign, if you are not abiding by it, you know that while the sign cannot give you a ticket, pull you over, or even bring about the appropriate action of correction, this individual in this car can. The difference is when you are on cruise control driving the speed limit, you are less likely to check behind you rear view mirrors or see if they're coming after you. Why? Because there is no reason for you to live in a sense of bondage or one of you will be corrected. In fact, some of us, when we drive by the police driving the speed limit, as we go by, we say to ourselves, I wish they would pull me over. Why? Because it creates a level of confidence. See, when you do the right thing, when the opportunity for bad things to happen to you come up, you are not as worried. Because blameless behavior bails you out of the emotional, mental, and sometimes physical bondage that bad behavior will put you in. Another way to say it could be this way. Not only does blameless behavior bail you out of your bondage, but we could also say it this way. Integrity is immunity. What do I mean by that? When an individual is doing the right thing, you don't have to worry about those who are doing the wrong thing. Talking to a young man here recently, actually, he helped me out with the track team. He was telling me a story about how he went to the house of one of his friends, picked them up, slash dropped them off to get something, I should say, and then they were going to drive off. Friend gets out of the car, goes into the house. It's his home. Runs back out a few minutes later and says, man, we got to go. Hurry up and drive off. The young man who was telling me the story says, what's going on? He says, man, I went in there, got to an altercation with my dad. He's calling the police. We got to go. Dad comes running out and says, do not go anywhere. Friend says, man, drive. The young man in whom was telling me the story said, I wasn't going nowhere. Now, regardless of societal situations or standards, both of these young men are African-American young men, so that can mean something in certain settings. Not only being African-American, but being young can mean something. Police show up, driver, young man telling me the story, said he told his friend, put your hands on the dashboard. Friend says, I'm not doing that. He says, no, you're going to put your hands on the dashboard because we don't want to cause any or any problems, because what the driver knows is, I'm innocent. I don't know what happened in that house. I don't know what you said, what you did. I know you're in my car, but I'm innocent. What's interesting is the person doing the driving was just fine. The person doing the riding is the one who is worried. Police show up. Put your hands up. It's interesting because this young man the whole time kept telling me, he said, Coach, I knew I was, not in tr I was not going to jail. And so I did everything they told me to do because I didn't want to give any, un 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 any reason or unreason or reasonable doubt of anything because of one thing. I knew I was innocent. And then he kept on telling me the point of the situation without telling me how the situation ended. 
I was like, fine. I was like, dude, so what happened when the police said, put your hands on the dad? I mean, like, like what? I mean, I, I mean, I know you're okay, you here, but what happened? He said, nothing happened. They took him and left me there. Almost is like, duh. Why? Because integrity is immunity. When I have not done anything wrong, I do not have to live in the fear of the consequences of those who are doing wrong. Another way we can say it is not only does limitless behavior bail you out of bondage, integrity is immunity, but purity promises protection. Okay? Don't miss this. I'll never forget, I was watching a special one time with Oprah Winfrey. All right, so this was a long time ago. I just dated myself. Watching a special with Oprah Winfrey, and she was talking about sexually transmitted diseases and uh, infections. Hopefully, there's no children in the sanctuary Come on. today. Come on. However, they probably have heard about this anyway. And so as she's doing this interview, she says to the woman who has contracted one of these sexually transmitted diseases, she continues to say to this woman, it can happen to anyone. And so everyone needs to get checked out. Everyone needs to be mindful of what could happen because you don't know. The next day I was talking to this church lady. She saw the same show. She said, it's interesting, as, as, as I kept hearing them say over and over and over again, you never know. You all need to be checked out because it could happen to you. She said, I didn't think that. I've been in a monogamous marriage like the last 40 years, and so I'm only with one person. They're only with one person. Guess what I'm not worried about? Now, don't get me wrong, okay? Notice what I said. They've been with one person. You've been with, okay, all right? <laughs> Don't miss that, all right? You know why so many of our young people, our singles, are worried about their health, living in fear of pregnancy, which is what's supposed to happen when you lay down with somebody. It's because they're not walking in purity. Purity promises protection, not just in the bedroom, but in life. When I'm walking in a sense of purity, it promises, it guarantees a certain level of protection. Now, I know for some of you are saying, well, wait a minute. What about that person who does it all right and bad things still happen? Listen, y'all, this is a general way of living. That if you practice this in your life, this is more than likely your outcome. This is not speaking to the exceptions to the norm. It is telling you what the norm is. And you and I cannot live in fear of exceptions all of our lives. If you do that, you won't do anything. Do you realize that if you get in your car, you may not make it home tonight? That don't stop you from going to work. It didn't stop you from going out on that date. It didn't stop you from going to that party or having a good time. Why? Because you do not live in fear of the exception. You live in light of and the wisdom of the norm. Solomon is saying here, just generally speaking, you and I need to understand that he who walks uh, uh, in, in integrity walks with security. Why? Because blameless behavior will bail you out. In essence, a lifestyle of honesty leads to living in liberty. You see, too many of us think that liberty is just freedom to be free and to move about, to move about. Liberty is not just something physical. It's emotional, psychological. Solomon is saying that when you and I live a lifestyle that is according to God's laws, conduct of not only honesty, but truth, that's real freedom. That's real liberty. There are certain things you don't have to worry about when you're living for the Lord. You just don't. You just don't. 
And there are certain things you will worry about when you do not live according to the Lord and his law. The proverb doesn't stop there. It says that he who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found out. So we get to the antithetical clause. We get to the opposite way of life or choosing to live if you want to choose not to live with integrity. Solomon starts off by saying, but he who perverts his ways. When he makes a statement, but he who perverts his ways, he is basically just using the Hebrew word in perverts that means to be uneven ground. False, distorted, or twisted. This is important, again, because words matter. They have a meaning. So in its general use, when this word is used, it often means uneven ground, false, distorted, or twisted. However, in the context in which it's used here in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9, it means more of this. But he who perverts his ways means the individual who makes crooked. Okay? Who makes crooked. Now, I want to be clear here because it is one thing to say to the person who chooses the wrong direction, to the person who chooses crookedness. That's one thing, but that's not what Solomon is communicating. Solomon is saying to the individual who makes their choice crooked. Ooh. Okay? There's a difference because you could be going down the right direction. We're about to do the right thing. The option to do it is right there. But instead of doing what is right, you choose to make what is right wrong. Right. Yesterday at the state track meet, coaches get in for free. Because my wife is a part-time assistant coach, there are times where she gets to benefit from what coaches get to experience, whether she is part-time or full-time. At the state meet, they're a little bit more strict. Coaches still get in for free, but, but, but you only get so many coaches getting in for free. Secondly, because I'm the coach and she helps out, whenever we go to meets around here locally, a lot of times people just let her in and the kids in for free because they love us, they like us, no problem. The state meet, they don't really care who you are. If you're not an athlete or a coach, you're not getting in for free. In fact, the price is hiked up from $5 per entry per person to $11 per entry per person. Y'all got a lot of kids. Due to the fact that my wife and I, when I came back to pick them up, meet had already started. I'd been there once, found a good parking spot. I went back to pick them up. As we're walking in, because it's kind of the break point in the meet, most folks have already paid to get in, and they're kind of going in and out. The person who was collecting the tickets didn't really pay attention, and we walked right on in. Now I got a dilemma, though, don't I? What is my dilemma? My dilemma is simply this, that we have got in for free. No one is going to now check on us or ask if we paid or not because the stadium is too many people, and once you get past that front gate, you are in. In fact, if you leave, they'll give you a stamp to get back in. So long as we get in free, I know they can go and come as they want to because they don't get a stamp or a red X that would grant them access. We go, we sit down. It wasn't 10 minutes. I looked at my wife. I said, I need to go pay for you and these kids. I sat there for about 10 minutes wrestling. But we in. I mean, they got plenty of money. Look at all these people. They got their money. You know, another thing I said, well, I mean, if it was $5, that would be, but 11 per, <laughs> nobody's going to check. Nobody's coming around asking for tickets. About 10 minutes, I wrestled. You know, the Lord, he just, he knows what to do for you in the moment because he knows what's coming up. See, I didn't really want to preach this proverb on this Sunday, but Instead of being able to preach what I really wanted to preach, I was like, I got to find something a little bit shorter because I ain't going to have as much time to prepare. And I don't want to rob y'all of all that is in God's word. So I had to pick a shorter proverb that I would have the appropriate time to prepare so that way you wouldn't just get me talking. You would get what God's word was saying. And so I picked this one. And as I'm sitting there in the stands inside, are you going to 
walk in integrity. Or you're going to choose to be crooked. See, there's a difference again when you can make something wrong that could be right. That means in that moment, it's not that you have chosen the wrong path. It is there is a path in front of you that you are walking down, and you make it crooked when it could simply just be straight. And I'm thankful that this sermon was in mine because I would not have probably done what I did. Nor could I sit up here and tell you this story if I wouldn't have went back down there to the entrance and said, hey, I owe y'all some money. Uh Why? Because I don't do I want to walk in security. I do not want to pervert a way that could be good. And I know what you're wondering. Did they make me pay? They tried. She tried, but Due to the area that we were in, the internet wasn't working that well. They couldn't take my electronic payment. I was like, so I want to do it. No, let me tell you what they did. They said, go to the front gate, because it's the side gate. They can take your money there. And guess what? Thus began the wrestling match a second time. I want you to know, I went back up in them stands and sat down for about five minutes. And that voice was like, are you going to be in integrity? Do you have character that reflects me? So I got my butt on up, walked back down to the front gate this time, not the side gate, and said, hey, here's what took place. Family got in, we didn't really pay, this, yada, yada, yada. I said, you know, like, I just, I'm sitting there, and I, I, the preacher side of me said, I got to go pay. Mm-hmm. Lady at the front counter said, you know what? I can't get my electronic system to work, so unless you got cash, I can't take your money. <laughs> Y'all, I had the cash, though. <laughs> <laughs> Why not leave my wallet in the car, right? <laughs> this woman looked at me and she said, It's okay. You're going through all this to pay and do the right thing. We're good. Go on back and have a seat. Now y'all can say, Look at God, all right? Okay? All right? Listen. So I want you to understand. Oftentimes in this life, we think we are defined by one act as opposed to a lifestyle of action. You see, when someone comes to you and says you have a character flaw, it may not be that your character is totally flawed. It may mean that an aspect of your character is flawed. And when you and I begin to recognize that an aspect of our character is flawed, then what we are realizing is that the habits in which we have formed in our lives are habits of dishonesty as opposed to honesty, even if it's only in one area of my life. So you can be good in 10 different areas, but if you suck in this one, Instead of focusing on the 10 that you're good in, focus on the one that you're not that good in. Why? Because this is not simply just a one-time, a one-action thing. This is your ability to walk out a lifestyle of integrity and character and character that is consistent with that of Christ. And all God was doing was seeing with me if I would go further and further and further. See, was I disingenuous or was I genuine? Let me be clear. I was genuine about the fact that I did not want to pay. But I was also genuine in the reality, the responsibility, 
that I need to pay. See, it's not what I wanted. It's what's right. It's not how you feel. It's how you should feel. So we can acknowledge what's going on, but then the Bible tells us that if you're going to live a life of freedom, liberty, then you need to live a life of integrity. But if you would distort or twist or make crooked that which could be straight, you will be found out. Now, in the Hebrew, I want you to know that this entire verse is about four or five words. So the phrase, will be found out, is just simply one word in the Hebrew. But it communicates this concept of will be found out. It means to reveal oneself or to be noticed. Not only does it mean to reveal oneself or to be noticed, but it also carries a connotation in this particular passage, in this context, of this sense of you and I not only being revealed or to be noticed, but to become known or to gain insight. In essence, here's what Solomon is saying. Solomon said, he who perverts his ways will be found out. In essence, he is saying, your dishonesty will be discovered. Wow. You see, this is why it's important in Clause A about the reliability and genuineness, because what he is saying is, when you choose to make the right way even crooked, when you choose crookedness or corruption in your life, at some point, your attempt to make everyone think that you are genuine in your actions, what will be revealed is your disgenuine spirit behind your actions. Don't miss that. He's saying, we're all going to know. We're all going to know who you really are. At some point, it's all going to, no matter how much you attempt to hide it, to cover it up, we will know. I tell people all the time in relationships, if you think the person is not faithful, you don't have to go look in. It'll show up on its own in due time. So you go look in and you'll find stuff that really ain't there because you just think it's there. But when it just shows up, there's no denying. I know some of you say, but I got to live with the fact that they're getting over me. They're not getting over on nobody. The truth will come to fruition, and you will know whether or not they have been honest or dishonest. It will be discovered, revealed. They will be exposed for who they really are. And I don't have to expose you. Why? Because in due time, God will expose you for me and for you. He who chooses to make things crooked. It will be made known to all those who are watching. Solomon is making this statement here, but he who perverts will be found out. It will be revealed. We will be take notice. It will be clear that their dishonesty is discovered. What is Solomon saying on today? Solomon is simply saying this. A lifestyle of honesty leads to living in liberty. Liberty is not just your physical freedom. It's your emotional and psychological freedom. See, the challenge of telling a lie is you got to always remember the lie. And it's hard to remember a lie because it's not the truth. You know it's not hard to remember? The truth. Because that's what happened. You want liberty? You want freedom? Not just physically. Spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. Live a lifestyle of honesty. Live a lifestyle according to the Lord's laws. But, there's a but in this proverb. Choosing crookedness will be uncovered. We will find out who you really are. Because who you really are will be revealed. You will be exposed. Your crookedness will become uncovered. Why? Because that's just simply how God works. A few weeks ago, I shared with you a story. One of the hardest things that I've had to do as a father, as a coach in a long time. Some of you were here, some of you were not here. It was in reference to my son, Seth, my oldest son. Who my oldest son, Seth, has been a part of the track team. This is his third year. And this year, for the first time in those three years, there was 
another young man who was running faster than my son. And as a result, I had to share with my son the difficult challenge of, I know you've always helped us get the states in this particular race, but I'm going to need you to step aside and let someone else run that race. And I told you it was very challenging, and I was trying to muster the strength to do it. And that morning of the regional track meet, as I'm beginning to share with my son, I'm a little emotional because this is troubling me. Mm. Seth reaches out his arm or his hand and puts it on my shoulder and says, Dad, it's going to be okay. As if to assure me that not only is he okay, but he wants me to know as his father that he's okay. At the meet that afternoon, the team that he was supposed to be on went out to not only qualify for the state meet, but to win the regional meet in qualifying for the state meet. When my son saw them qualify, he was sitting in the stands with his mother. Y'all know how she felt. <laughs> As they won, I get a text from her and saying, congratulations, but... I still ain't happy. She used some other words, but I won't say them from the pulpit. <laughs> Seth came down to the center of the field, hugged his teammates, told them congratulations, nice job, guys, and he did it with this huge smile. So after the meet, I pulled my son aside and I said, hey, are you, are you really okay? He said, you know what, Dad? I'm good. This hasn't been the best season. I'm not running my fastest, nor even as fast as I expected. But since the season has not been going the way I would have liked, it's okay. Every day after that, he showed up to practice with the same attitude of working hard, realizing that to some degree this season was somewhat of what we consider a bust, meaning it did not go as well as planned. Every day he showed up. Every day he tried to run faster and faster. And in practice, I got to tell you, it looked like he was getting slower and slower. And then all of a sudden, one of the individuals who was supposed to be on that team, the one who actually took my son's place, decided no longer to be a part of the team. So in a matter of a couple of days, before the state meet, we come to Seth, I come to Seth and say, hey, son, your number is being called. How do you feel about being on this relay team? Seth was like, mm, I'm good. And not like I'm good, like I won't do it, but like, no problem, Dad. What's interesting is sometimes you wonder what's in the heart of a person. What is truly motivating them? In this moment, in these last couple of days, what I realized is motivating my son. It's not always what he wants, but sometimes just what is best. And not just best for him, but best for those who are with him. <laughs> Seth went out there yesterday at the state track meet, and he ran like it was last year. This joker ran so fast that I think he is running as fast as he was last year. What's interesting is the season is over. It's the last meet. The good news is it really don't matter how slow you run all season long. If you save your best for the last meet, that's all we're going to remember anyway. I think what God was doing for me, his father, was revealing the integrity and character that was inside my son. But what he was doing for my son was also helping him understand that, hey, when you do the right thing, with the right motive, you get to live in security or liberty. He's going to practice. He's worked out. He hasn't complained. He has shown up every day and communicated whatever's best for the team. So all of a sudden, God decides, well, that's not the end of the story. 
I'm going to call your number, and in calling your number, I'm going to help you do what you have been unable to do because I know what's inside of you. What I saw yesterday was not only my son get out there with three other guys and run, but a team that could barely get on the podium made all state, fourth in the state. Why? Because this proverb is not just about you and I making decisions and experiencing life because of worldly or man's actual projections or actions are over us. It is about the individual's ability to walk in godly obedience, godly character and integrity, so therefore, not only do they walk in a certain level of freedom and liberty, but they also walk in confidence. Confidence. That even when I can't do it, he will do it for me. Let me ask you a question. What is truly behind the motivation or the motives for what you are doing. If we dig deep enough, if we search hard enough, did you come to church this morning because you love him or because you simply needed him to do something for you? Did you come here because you love and want to worship him or did you come here because it just looks good and you can check it off your list? Part of walking in integrity is it's not just something you do haphazardly. It is something that is a habit in your life. You will live a life of honesty or a life of dishonesty. But I guarantee you, whichever you choose, It'll all reveal itself in the end. He who walks in integrity walks securely. But he or she who will pervert his or her ways, you will be found out. This is the word of God. Hear it, believe it, and receive it on today. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are. How you continue to work in all of our lives, not only draw us closer to you, but to give us insight to your word and your truth. Lord, hold us close. And as you hold us close, as you keep us connected to you, Lord, help us to walk in the character of integrity. Not perfection, but blameless behavior. Lord, I pray on today that you would take the words that have come out of my mouth that you will mold them, shape them, that you will begin to apply them to the hearts and the minds of your people, individually and collectively, so that that way they walk out of here. We walk out of here not only with the truth, but with the truth being manifested in a way in which it has not only been molded to us, but it also molds us, makes us more like you. Lord, we do not want to pervert our ways. We do want to walk in integrity. We want to be individuals who, who do walk in honesty. So, Lord, help us to live those lives and lifestyles that is according to your law. Because if you do this, and we will commit to it, we will experience true, true life, liberty, and even at times in happiness in our pursuit of that life and that liberty. Give you all praise, honor, credit, and glory because you are God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, we don't want to end the service without giving you the opportunity to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. The Bible declares that you and I are sinners in need of a Savior. That Savior is Jesus Christ. What that simply means is that you and I have fallen short of God's holy standard. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. God cannot be in the presence of imperfect people. But because of his overwhelming love for you, for me, he's found a way to reconcile us, to forgive us of our sin, to save us from the punishment of hell. Today, if you want to know for sure that if you died today, if you took your last breath, that you would be in heaven, 
And I said, Dad, you need to make a decision to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Right where you're at, if you want to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. I said, you pray this prayer with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God in heaven, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of your salvation. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Today, I accept him and I give you my life. Come into my heart and make me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you today who are looking to recommit your life to the Lord, maybe you haven't been walking in the type of integrity in your relationship with your spouse. Maybe there's a lot of dishonesty with you at your job or just with other people. Maybe you begin to notice that somehow you begin to shift away from that which is right to that which is more wrong. When given the opportunity to go down the right path, you somehow find the wrong way or the wrong in going down the right path. But today you want to recommit. You want God to know that you are his son, his daughter. You're coming back home. There's a prayer for you also. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If this is you, repeat after me. My Father, am my God in heaven. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for keeping me, even as I wandered away. Today, I returned back home, taking my hand, placing it once again in yours, asking you to lead me, lead me the rest of the way home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, that's a good word. I mean, it, it started even during the prayer time with the exhortation of stop living a life of secrecy. Like, and the person did not know what pastor's message was going to be about, but they just said, I just feel like this week as I have been studying God's word, that's what I kept hearing was get rid of the secrets because the secrets just keep you bound. But let me say this, because I believe also the enemy has been very strategic where the world and its belief that perversion is the way to live has trickled its way into the church. And so you show up every Sunday having lived perverted all week and you think because people haven't found out that I'm good because everybody else, I mean the world, they perverted as all get out and they seem to be doing just fine. Just getting what they want, doing what they want. No, this, this proverb is true. When you walk in integrity, you absolutely walk securely. People can lie on you but your character will carry you. People can try to throw mud on your name and it simply won't stick because you are walking with such confidence. Please do not believe what other people are living, that you have to lie, cheat, and steal about who you are or about God's grace on your life. Don't hide that either because his grace on your life points to him and not to you. So even when people are asking you, why are you doing what's right? Because it's right. You can say, because there's a God who's watching. And though you didn't see me and my family walk in having not paid, I know the Lord has been dealing and saying, son, you need to go. You, you, just, you just need to go ahead and pay. Go, go on down there and do it. And just the testimony of that, let that be good enough, because it is good. Because that's what God's word says. I, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite Proverbs. I'll never forget the, the, the time we were talking to a couple in seminary, and the husband shared this verse with us, and it stuck. I was like, wow. But that's what living for Christ means. Mm. It's funny because the character theme for the month of May that I've been teaching my class is integrity. And what is integrity? And my class can tell me integrity is doing what's right because it's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, when, whenever they're doing something, I can say, are you doing what's right? Yes, how do you know? Because it's right, Ms. K. Yeah. And so I, I, I love that today you, you preach that sermon. 
But because of that sermon, if there were any of you online, whenever you watch this, if you prayed either of those prayers, we want you to know we want to walk securely with you. No, we're not a perfect people. Nobody is asking for perfection. We're simply, ask, we're simply asking you to do what's right because it's right. It's not going to be popular. But I want us to be a people who walk confidently in this city. Part of the reason we don't walk confidently is because we're trying to live a perverted life and then coming to the church and it's not lasting, which is why we get uncomfortable coming here. But let us be a people that walks confidently. Amen. 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 What a good Amen. word. That was a great summary. Well, I could have used some of that in my message. <laughs> Yo, we're so excited so that you guys showed up on today to be a yeah. part of our service on today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so sad I didn't have a song for it, but... It's all good. You had a good word it, for it, though. It was, it was Shoot. I was taking mental, some notes myself. <laughs> Listen, we want you to stand to your feet as we prepare to dismiss you. Yeah. We don't want you to forget that for those of you who are giving for your tithes and your offering, several ways to give here at Kingdom Life Church, give through our cash app, give through our online mobile device as well as online through your computer devices. For those of you who are here today, yeah. we want you to fill out your offering if you're not going to give electronically and just put your offering in the black box, one of the black boxes that are at the rear of the sanctuary. We want to thank you for being here on today. We so appreciate you. If this is your first or second time, you're a visitor. Welcome. My wife and I would love to meet you. We welcome you here at the Kingdom yeah. Life Church. Thank you for worshiping with us. And if you will stick around, come next door to the fellowship hall. We would love to shake your hand, greet you, and talk for a few moments. Fellowship Hall is open for anybody to go over there and to enjoy. It's a lot cooler over there, too, uh, because both units are working over there. Um, yeah. So we're so excited that you guys were here on today. Anything you want to say before we get out of here? No. I mean, I had a song, but I don't know. Okay. I'm not going to do the song. You sure? All right. Yeah. Thank you for being here on today. Every head bowed, every eye closed, we pray a prayer blessing over you. Yeah. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you again for this opportunity to gather together. Thank you for the word in which you have given us on today. Pray that not only will it be something that we hear with our ears, but that we will hang on to with our minds and our hearts, that we will heed it with our hands. So we pray and ask that you continue to go before us all around us, that we will not only trust you, but Lord, we will allow your hand of guidance, provision, and protection to lead us. Yeah. Thank you again for all your wonderful blessings. You. Give you all praise, honor, credit, and glory because you and you alone are God. Thanking you not only for great gifts, mm. wonderful blessings, but the greatest gift, the greatest blessing. That's the relationship with Jesus Christ, yeah. our Lord. It's in his name that we pray, that we ask all these things. Yeah. All God's people said, amen, 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 amen. God bless you. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to Kingdom Life Church's YouTube channel. Yes, thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We hope to see you here in person sometime soon. God bless.